keep smiling. All I know. All set? <coughs> Good evening and welcome to Southern School Committee meeting of Tuesday, April 10th, 2012. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. At this time, we have an agenda item two, public input. Is there anyone from the audience that wishes to address the school committee? Just step to the podium and just state your name for the record. Good evening. Should be I on. Think Sometimes it takes a minute. Testing. There Hello. you go. Okay. Good evening. My name is Wally McKenzie, and I am a resident of Southbridge. Uh, the, what brings me here tonight, uh, and I guess I didn't even say uh, good evening to uh, the Superintendent uh, Ely and uh, uh, the uh, members of the school committee, uh, so I will say that now. Good evening. I have a, an issue that is of great concern to me, and I know to a lot of people, and if it's all right, if you would just give me a, a brief few minutes, I'd like to read from my notes and uh, maybe make a comment and then I'll be uh, ended. Uh, as I was a child, I attended a school and was taught by various subjects with, by a, a number of different teachers. Whatever teachers that were standing before us in class were usually recognized as the absolute authority uh, on the subjects that they were teaching at the time. We as students believed that whatever the teachers taught was the absolute truth. After all, they were the teachers and they knew more than we did. I believe the teachers are still viewed in this manner today. That they are the authority in the subjects that they teach. Now my son James attends a school here in Southbridge. Uh, he's in uh, grade seven. And during the school year, he was being taught the theory of evolution. I have a great respect for his teachers, and I find her to be an excellent educator. I find, uh, I, I don't know where I fit in the, in the uh, concept, but I believe that the school administration <coughs> and the school committee is an excellent source of concern for the education of our students in this community. I have the highest regard for Mr. Eli and, and for the school committee. There's no one here that I am concerned or have any, any concerns about, just the highest consideration of praise. We are a Christian family, and we ascribe to the teachings that are found in the Holy Bible. At home, I'm able to discuss with my son both the theory of evolution and the theory of creation. For the most part, the rest of the students in my son's class don't have this privilege. Not hearing the other side of the coin, they have nothing to compare evolution to. And therefore, the theory of evolution in their minds becomes fact. If schools are going to educate, they cannot pick and choose only parts of truth. They need to present the whole truth, or at least in this case, both sides of the theories. Even in a court of law, they don't just present the prosecutor's side of a case. They have to present the defense's side as well to learn the truth. I therefore propose that both sides of these theories be presented, both theories, evolution and creation, so that the students can make an intelligent decision as to which one they choose to believe. I know that our country was found on Christian principles. I also noticed that as you rose and said a Pledge of Allegiance, you did say one nation under God. And this is a school committee saying this. So there has to be some kind of an understanding of God and who God is. We need to acknowledge both concepts. And this is what I'm asking you to do. I know you can't do it this year. I don't even know if you can do it in this town. And I can tell you this, that I do plan on going as far as I can with this, all the way up to the, to the state level if I have to. Because I believe 
that we're shortchanging our students. Now, some people say, well, that's not science. Well, we don't teach religion in the public schools. So therefore, if you're going to teach evolution, you need to teach the other side of the coin as well. One of the teaching, well, I'm not going to say that. I'm going to say something else. Um, I believe that teachers, when they do teach this concept, they teach it as a theory. They say, this is a theory. But kids don't understand or grasp the word theory. I don't even know if they understand what it means, most of them, or half of them. If you ask tomorrow in the classes, what does theory mean to you? You're going to get a variety of different answers. So they're not going to understand theory of evolution. They're going to understand fact of evolution. So what I ask you to do is consider next, next year in your curriculum, I don't know where the money would come from, but I don't know where the money comes from to teach evolution. So what I would ask you to do is consider incorporating that concept in addition to the teaching of the theory of evolution. I'm not saying don't teach evolution. I'm saying teach both sides. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. McKenzie. What we'll do is um, we'd have to take a look at our frameworks and the state guidelines as far as frameworks. And I'll refer this over to our curriculum subcommittee chairman, Mr. DiGregorio. And he can take a look at working with, uh, maybe have a meeting with the um, curriculum director to just take a look at that and, and see if there has to be a difference or, or points made with the state level to advise that as well. Okay, Mr. McKenzie? Thank you for bringing that to our attention. Is there anyone else from the audience that wishes to address the school committee? Anyone else? Seeing none, I'll call this meeting to order. Roll call, Mr. Secretary. Mr. DiGregorio? Present. Dr. Domenico? She's excused. Mr. Joban? Present. Mr. Lazo? Present. Dr. O'Leary? I'm not sure where he's in. He may be uh, late, but at this time he's absent. Mrs. Principe? Present. Mrs. Woodruff? Present. Five present. We do have a quorum. Agenda item five, approval of minutes of the regular school committee meeting of March 27, 2012. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Are there any errors, corrections, or omissions from any? Seeing none, all those in favor? Okay. That's uh, four, Mr. DeGore has been excused. Item six, reports, representative of the Student Advisory Committee, Helena Benoit. Good evening, Helena. Good evening. Tonight, the band is holding a concert. This Thursday, the band is leaving for their trip to DC. They're going to view the monuments and other great adventures down there. The show choir is holding auditions Wednesday for any student interested. Next year's theme is entertainment. This Friday, April 13th, is the College Bowl. Teams from each class will be participating. The Science Fair and Invention Convention is April 24th. The Student Council would like to thank Chairman Jovian for sitting down with us the other day for our talk show. And that is all. Thank you, Helen. <clears throat> Mr. Lazo? I would just like to comment under this uh, agenda item to the student rep. It was an outstanding article in a paper, and we're, we're very proud of you and your, uh, your whole accomplishments and stuff that you've done at Southbridge High School, and I'm sure that was just the tip of the iceberg. Thank, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yes. Point well taken. Congratulations, Helena. Thank you. And thank you for having me on your student uh, council uh, program the other day with the other students. I appreciated that. Yes, that's it's good. already on the um, website for anybody who's interested. That's shshistorydepartment.net. Thank you. Uh, presentations? No presentations. We have no pres report of the superintendent. Uh, I want to save my report till we get to the unfinished business because it would entail most of what's on there. Okay. Report of the business manager, Mr. Wiggins. Good evening. Good evening. Um, first item that is in your agenda packet is a proposal for a revised warrant approval process. Uh, the committee knows that for some time it's concerned me that the process that we have for getting an invoice in and getting it approved and getting that check out the door to pay that vendor in a timely fashion, you know, is an issue. Now to some degree those issues are dictated by state law, uh, some by local ordinance. Um, but in any event, I've worked very hard and, and I want to commend the town treasurer and the town accountant slash finance director for working very diligently with me to try and come up with a process that will streamline to the maximum extent we can. It's still conceivably about a 20-day process, 
Right now, that process can be 30 days or more. So there's some significant cutting down of time. There are a couple of things that, in, under your action items, that would be required of the school committee to consider, however. Um, for payroll warrants, you by law can designate one person to sign the payroll warrants. You do not need a majority of the committee. Uh, typically speaking, what school committees uh, that I've worked with in the past have done, they designate one person and an alternate. So that is one request for action that we have later on tonight. Uh, secondly, for expenditure warrants, you can designate three people as a subcommittee. And again, typically what I've seen in other school committees that I've dealt with is they'll designate a subcommittee of three and one alternate. Um, and particularly in the summer months, they'll just kind of get together informally and talk who's going to be out of town and they'll cover each other that way. Um, the third thing that, again, in these structures where the subcommittees are used to sign warrants to get them moving is included on the agenda at your regular meetings is a consent agenda. And basically that's a section where all the different warrants that had been signed off on would be listed by warrant number and by amount. And basically there would be a motion to approve the consent agenda which would by virtue of it approve all of those warrants that are within the consent agenda, typically not debated. If there was a concern, something can always be pulled off of a consent agenda and discussed under other business. We'd like to have you propose changing your agenda to include that for the approval of these warrants. And it's really more of a confirmation of the warrants, I guess I'd have to say, than an approval. And then the final thing is timing. Um, when I first approached the, the, the finance director and the town treasurer and I said, rather than back up the warrant process, I'd actually like to push it forward as far as our process in the office, I think they thought I was a little nuts. But basically what we're, con what we're proposing is that basically we would be preparing the physical warrant on uh, basically Tuesday afternoon, Wednesday, and Thursday morning. Thursday by noon, I would receive a, 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 a finished warrant that had been double checked by my staff person, I would then go through it and check it. I would sign off on it. Then by four o'clock on Thursday, we'd actually bring the warrant downstairs because town offices are open till eight o'clock at night. And it would be available to school committee members to come in on Thursday night and sign. And again, we're talking about those subcommittee members. They would then leave it in a place for myself or have actually talked to uh, Katie Dress, who also on Friday morning sometimes comes in at seven o'clock in the morning and one of us would come in, we would get that warrant, we would also have it available Friday morning at seven o'clock here in these offices to be signed. The idea is that we would get all of our signatures, hopefully by nine o'clock in the morning on Friday, be able to push that downstairs, and then the process that the town needs to go through would begin in earnest the following Monday. They can just start right off on it. And again, that whole timing process works out that you know, conceivably, it could be as little as 14 days that somebody would see a check going in the mail, but at a maximum, probably about 20. Um, a marked improvement, I think, over what we have right now. It would be a process that we feel we could publish on the business website to make uh, vendors, both local and, and regional vendors, you know, understand, hey, this is how it's going to work. And a lot of angst, I think, would go away in that process. So, again, that's kind of a description of what we've proposed before you. There is a little timeline that I put in that agenda packet for you to hopefully follow as to how it works. And uh, having said that, I would be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Okay. No questions? Okay. That means we would move on to a financial report. And again, I do apologize for not getting this in your packet. Um, certainly, uh, you know, take the time to go through this. And as always, you can come back to me with questions. I will make a couple of brief notes on the financial report. Um, the first thing I would note is, um, as the superintendent knows, right now the bane of my existence is a Title IIA grant. <laughs> um, and so quite frankly, I have projected the numbers here as if we would not get the Title IIA grant. Um, I think we will get it eventually. Um, it will be impactful in a positive sense on the budget, um, but quite frankly, it has been going on so long and there seems to be a new hoop every time I turn around that I would rather give you again a more conservative estimate, which would be that we don't get that grant this year. Uh, on a plus side, 
uh, in talking with the folks at UMass and uh, with the U.S. Department of Education, um, the committee is probably aware of a, a U.S. I, I call it the U.S. History Grant. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, apparently, there was a provision in that grant to take about sixty-five thousand dollars to defray the business administrator's salary and business office expenditures. That was never drawn down. Um, there was some question from the town auditor about whether or not that was legitimate. I've reviewed um, the information with the town accountant. I've reviewed the town auditor's information. It's my position that particularly seeing how it is either we draw this money down or it goes back to the federal government. There is no in-between that I am going to propose that before the end of the month to attempt to draw that money down. Um, so that may be a positive thing in a revenue picture. Uh, again, that's not factored into the numbers you have here. Um, but I want to make you aware that that is something that we are pursuing. Uh, the bottom line fund balance that I'm projecting for you is $21,882.32. That's a, a decrease of a little over $5,000 from the last report. Uh, I would commend to you the last page of the report, or actually I guess I've really had it detailed on the second page of the narrative too. Um, there are some items that, again, have not yet been encumbered, um, either because they can't or we're in the process of finishing up some of those contracts. Um, but these are pretty well defined now. Uh, having said that, of course, tomorrow I'll find out there's something that I've forgotten. But um, very briefly, we have scheduled for an asset inventory to take place first week of May. Um, that's a pretty hard number now of $20,000, and we're in the process of, of doing the the contract and purchase orders on those. Um, we're going to probably need still about $10,000 more for our technology consultant. Um, finishing up the last group of items and, and issues that we have. Um, one thing with some of the decisions we needed to make with the technology budget, we were looking for different ways to accomplish some things to maximize the amount of the remaining technology budget that we could use to put equipment in the hands of kids. One of the ways that we can do that is there are um, three computer stations. Um, it's basically a little bit more sophisticated computer that operates multiple monitors. Okay, we need one of these for our network consultant, our network consultant, our network engineer. Uh, one of them for the new position that's been proposed in the school committee's budget at the middle high school, and we really need one very very similar to this for our technician who's going to be working, you know, primarily at the, uh, the elementary schools as well. So I'm proposing that we set aside some money in the budget, this year's budget, to purchase those. That will free up a comparable amount of money um, in the technology budget of the new middle high school to put, again, more units directly in the hands of kids. Uh, there is also, in full disclosure, I am proposing approximately $2,000 to replace well, actually, to purchase a laptop for the business manager. Currently, the business manager's laptop is his personal laptop. Um, and um, I tend to work very mobily, so um, I, I have proposed that. Um, there is going to need to be, and again, I say this, and then we tested some radios today, so I may actually, this may be some money that I can save a little bit on, but uh, we did feel that we were going to need new repeaters and uh, new radios and a new repeater for the new middle high school for our maintenance and custodial staff. Uh, that figure may come down a little bit based on some of our testing today. So, but I'm still holding the 30,000 there. Uh, again, there's a general contingency for FF&E and technology for the new middle high school, uh, a general contingency for elementary reconfiguration. Both of those are $40,000. And then the item that I begin to get a harder number on, it was in the past lumped in with one of the contingencies, was a new food service truck. Um, our ideal food service truck um, is a box truck with a lift gate that would also allow us to power um, warmers and coolers. In other words, we could roll them in, warm stuff would stay warm, cool stuff would stay cool, we transport it to the various schools. Um, the lift gate is the lift gate is probably a deal breaker. We absolutely will need that. To the degree of being able to, you know, use electric warmers and coolers, we could accommodate using Cambros or other devices if we needed to, but we really do need a bigger truck and one with a lift gate to handle the movement of this uh, food, particularly because it's going to be going further distance. Um, and uh, it's really going to be the satellite location. 
uh, for all of our schools. If there are any questions now or obviously in the future when you've had a chance to digest this, uh, happy to answer them. Any questions? Mrs. Principal? Thank you. Um, the last page, the mass public school tuition, the virtual school, is yes. that the Greenfield, Massachusetts school? That's the Greenfield, Massachusetts school. And, and it was 10,000 last year. Yes. And, and this year? Well, it, it is actually. It one student? What, it it actually may end up being nothing because I keep getting credits. Well, I see there's the anticipated expenditure is 5,000. Yes, and I've, I'm, hel I'm holding that now as a conservative number, but I've received basically two credits and no bills. Um, so I'm not, I'm not, honestly, I'm not sure what the final number is going to be there, could, but it's definitely not going to be 10,000. Could you refresh our memory as to the cost per student that participates in this virtual experience? Like 5,000 5, students. It is, so we 5, had two per, students. Right. It was two students that we budgeted for. Yeah, there was one student that, that we budgeted for that didn't go. Okay. That's why we got the credit back. Right. And there's another student, I think, went for part of the year. Yeah. Okay. Um, but but it's not gone the whole year. So I've held the one student's number in there, um, but I believe it's going to be less than that. Yes, I just want to keep going with this. If, if I were a parent that wanted to send my child to this virtual school, what, what is involved in this? Actually, the superintendent may be able to answer that better than I. I know that in speaking with my brethren in the general business roundtable in, in our geographic area, there's been considerable um, controversy, I guess, with the virtual high school. And I think not all from our end. I, I think there have been parents who maybe expected it to be more than it is. I, th I think the key, though, is it's not a virtual high school. It's actually a virtual school. So yeah. the, the, the children we're talking about are kindergarten, yeah. first grade age. They're not high school students. Right. So it's young. Uh, and and my, they're basically, they, they get their teaching on a computer. Uh, and I think it, it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's not a replacement for the personal contact of a classroom. Uh, and and uh, we don't generally know about it because it's, a, it's almost a school choice kind of thing. They, they, they yeah. choose to go there. We may not ever have seen the child. And so we find out when we get the bill, and unfortunately the bills have been uh, not accurate, Correct. and now we're getting credits back because the kid actually never went. And so I mean, it's, it's, a little, uh, it's, it's a little hard to, to put your thumb on, uh, but and quite frankly, we don't really have a lot of records on it. It's just something they send us, and then we have to verify the address and those kind of things. But uh, the actual education, Educational value, I, I really can't comment on because I, I, I just my personal philosophy is person-to-person -person contacts the best way to teach kids. Uh, but I, I mean, I, especially at that age. Uh, but I, I'll leave it at that and, and to say that right now we're not talking about a high school age kid or a middle school age kid. We're talking about elementary, little elementary, like five-year-old, six-year-old. And that's who that's who is enrolled now. But how far, does it go up through high school? I think virtual? it goes all the way up through twelfth grade. Yes. yes. And, I, and again, just again from other business administrators, what their experience has been is that there, for example, were a number of homeschool parents mm -hmm. that looked at it as an alternative for homeschooling, um, and I think some find it successful. Um, others have withdrawn and gone back into the conventional classroom because it was or back to conventional homeschooling. I guess if you can say that. Um, because um, it wasn't really what they expected. Thank you. Are you all set, Mr. Prince? Yes, thanks. Okay. Mr. Lazar? Yes. <clears throat> I have a question on the uh, food service van. I mean, first of all, I know mm -hmm. that we have to replace it. I think the approach is excellent. I was uh, involved in a uh, serve safe program. I took the class and I was talking with a person who uh, talked about Project Grow that we uh, mm -hmm. service them. Yes. And uh, as we all know in the serve safe world that uh, any cold product should be delivered uh, 41 degrees or less. It was delivered at 42 degrees when they checked it. So some of our equipment's antiquated, the high school's tired, and the philosophy is hold on, the new school is coming, the new kitchen, the equipment. My, my uh, question is, I mean, which is a good, I'm, I'm glad we're doing this uh, uh, for the uh, serve safe uh, rules. But 
the purchase of the band is coming out of the Southbridge Town uh, School budget. It's not coming out of food service budget. Am I understanding that? It is not coming out of the food service budget because, again, one of the issues right now with the food service budget is that you do not have a fund balance built up to the point of where it could do this. Now, I will tell you, and, and um, I will tell you that at the next meeting we'll get you uh, a more formal report. The fund balance as of the end of, I think it's the end of March, but I'll say the end of February to be on the safe side, um, had grown from about $18,000 last year to approximately $50,000. Um, so we've had a very well managed program by our new food service director. It's worked very, very hard and is very cognizant of the fact that we need to build up that fund balance to, you know, three months operating expenses as quickly as possible without obviously jeopardizing the but, service that, to the kids. But, but right now we do not have the funds in the food service program to fund a vehicle. So there, there isn't funds to purchase it in Correct. the food service budget? Okay. I have another issue that I want to talk on the new business, but I just wanted to understand where it came from uh, as far as the financing and why. Thank you. Yes. Mr. Ely? Terry, is, 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 is there a possibility to look at the fund balance in the Helping Hands Preschool? Because this van will service the Helping Hands Preschool. It'll actually it'll serve food. I mean, it'll, it'll deliver food to that program, will it not? There's a possibility of looking at some of the funding coming, coming from, from, that, from there. Coming from that the, the other thing is, and, and sometimes you answer a question too short and then you think about it afterwards, to go back to uh, uh, Mr. Lazo's question, there's also a possibility that down the road that the food service could actually buy the van from the district. So while we don't have the funds now to purchase that van, that down the road the food service program, when it had an acceptable fund balance, could purchase this from the district. Okay. You know, and, and transfer ownership, and then that money could be replaced into the general fund, and um, you know that is something that could happen in the future. Um, it's really a matter right now of food service cash flow, or else we wouldn't be talking about it as a potential general fund expense. Any further questions? Could I just ask a question going to food service? There's a, it's probably under old business, but well, it's your report. Um, at what point are we going to discuss whether we're going to have a summer feeding program or not? Um, I mean, I know there's grants out there, so I, I don't want anything to come no. upon the school district to have to fund that program if we're going to miss a grant period or anything like that. I, I know this, that the food service director has been in some meetings right now. The grants are just starting to open up. Um, I think if the committee would like, I'm not sure what's on the second meeting in April's agenda, but we probably could come up with something for that. To discuss that program. It will have to be, we already know it will have to be somewhat different this year from what it would normally be because we're reconfiguring elementary schools, we're moving into the new high school, so it, it, it would be necessarily a little different this year. I would also say that the, the state has been very active in trying to help us. For example, the state um, the other day had hooked up um, our food service director, Sue Pinkham, with an intern that basically, at no cost to us, could be running that summer program, which would be very, very critical given that Sue will need to work on, obviously, working with the, not only the new school, but the kitchens as they will need to be slightly reconfigured to deal with the increased population at the elementary level. So the state is very active and has a very deep interest in us continuing to run the program. We'll take it up in a future meeting then. Okay. Anything further for the business manager? Seeing none, moving on to school committee actions. One, vote to approve a donation to Eastwood Road School in the amount of $2,280 by Hyde Tools Manufacturing. So move. Second. Discussion? Seeing none, roll call. Mrs. Woodruff? Yes. Mr. DiGregorio? Yes. Mr. Jovan? Yes. Mr. Lazo? Yes. Mrs. Principe? Yes. <coughs> Five yes. <coughs> Thank you to Hyde Tools for that generous donation to East Road School. Item two, move to appoint one school committee member to sign the payroll warrants and appoint one school committee member as the alternate should the primary member be unavailable. One, one signature shall constitute an approved payroll warrant. Is there a motion? So moved. Discussion? 
Terry, at, at, at what point do we want to name those people <laughs> that are going to do this? I mean, oh, I saw your original motion was to yeah. have the name school committee member Shell, but that got translated differently on the agenda. I, I would say um, ideally it would be tonight, but very soon. All right. Yeah. All right. Is there anyone that uh, wishes to uh, serve in that? Then we can entertain a motion to amend this and include that language as opposed to a separate. Yes. Would that be appropriate, Mr. Lazo? Yes. yes. Okay. Is anybody interested? I know Mr. Lazo had done the payroll before. He was payroll. He was before. payroll before. And the alternate? Uh, I cannot, unfortunately. Oh, yeah. Dave, Dave can. cannot. I'll no. do it. All right, Mrs. Prince Bay. All right. Um, so I'll entertain a motion to amend this to, and, to and to name Scott Lazo as the uh, primary uh, member and Mary Ellen Principal as the alternate member. So moved. Second. Okay, so that's the amendment. Do you have that amendment there, Max? Okay. Any discussion on the amendment? Mm -hmm. Seeing none, roll call on the amendment. Mr. DiGregorio? Yes. Yes. Mr. Jovian? Yes. Mr. Lazo? Yes. Mrs. Principe? Yes. Mrs. Woodruff? Yes. Five yes. Okay. <clears throat> now on the main motion as amended, uh, which would read, move to appoint one school committee member to sign the payroll warrant and appoint one school committee member as the alternate should the primary member be unavailable. One signature shall constitute an approved payroll warrant. Primary member will be school committee member Scott Lazo. Alternate will be school committee member Mary Ellen Principe. Okay, any questions on that? Roll call. Mr. Jovian? Yes. Mr. Lazo? Yes. Mrs. Principe? Yes. Mrs. Woodruff? Yes. Mr. DiGregorio? Yes. Five yes. Item three is move to appoint three school committee members to sign the expenditure warrant and appoint one school committee member as the alternate should a primary member be unavailable. Three signatures shall constitute an approved expenditure warrant. So move. Second. Okay. Mr. Lazo. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think it would only be proper that you, um, uh, if you use the subcommittee that is existing for finance, I don't know if the school committee feels the same way. Uh, I would recommend um, on the discussion that the, the Budget, Facilities, and Transportation Subcommittee, because finance is under it, could uh, probably be an easy fix to the issue. Yeah. So is that in the, motion, in the form of an amendment? I'll make that in the form of an amendment that we uh, make the, um, again, the Budget, Facilities, and Transportation Subcommittee, uh, the signatures, and the alternate of that committee to be the alternate. Second. Okay. Any discussion on that? Seeing none. Roll call on the amendment. Mr. Lazo? Yes. Mrs. Principe? Yes. Mrs. Woodruff? Yes. Mr. DiGregorio? Yes. Mr. Jovian? Yes. Five yes. Okay. Now the main motion as amended. The motion will be moved to appoint three school committee members to sign the expenditure warrants and appoint one school committee member as the alternate should a primary member be unavailable. Three signatures shall constitute an approved expenditure warrant. Subcommittee to consist of the Budget, Facilities, and Transportation Subcommittee of the School Committee. Correct? Correct. Okay. Any further discussion on that main motion? Seeing none, roll call. Mrs. Principe? Yes. Mrs. Woodruff? Yes. Mr. DiGregorio? Yes. Mr. Jovian? Yes. Mr. Lazo? Yes. Five yes. Item four, move that a consent item section be added to every regular school committee meeting agenda under which all warrants not approved at a previous meeting shall be placed by warrant number and total amount of said warrant. Other items of non-controversial nature shall, as but not limited to the approval of minutes, may also be placed under the consent item section at the discretion of the chair. Any member may request an item be removed from the consent item section for discussion and separate vote. Such discussion and note to take place under the unfinished section of the agenda. So move. Second. Discussion? I would just make one note in that I think the word note in the last sentence of that motion should be vote. Okay. I think she took it right from your original. Yeah, I know she did. And okay. <laughs> that's so my, to change my, that, that's my spelling my, issues? Is it? <laughs> and vote to take place under yeah. the unfinished business. Okay. Can I type on the spell check? <laughs> any, any further discussion on it? Or oh, is there one motion? So move. Second? Second. Mrs. Woodruff, any further discussion on that? Say none, roll call. Mrs. Woodruff? Yes. Mr. DiGregorio? Yes. Mr. Jovian? Yes. Mr. Lazo? Yes. Mrs. Principe? Yes. Five yes. 
<coughs> Unfinished business. Uh, first, the district reconfiguration and updated progress. Mr. Ely? Yes, you have uh, in your packets, I believe, a, uh, a memo basically outlining the boundaries that we have tentatively established for the school zones for Charlton Street School and West Street School. Uh, those, uh, Mr. Uh, Wigan and I worked together. Mr. Wigan did most of the work, at, as usual, uh, to, to put these zones together. We had to do some interesting things. Uh, we started with a certain premises and we had to move one, probably one thing that's the most unusual is that Worcester Street, because of the demographic balance that we wanted to try to achieve, the, the entire Worcester Street uh, population would be, would go to West Street. There's actually a map over here of this town with the lines drawn and on either side of the line, I think they can show it on TV, uh, that actually shows where the where the people uh, where the students would go living on any street in town, and then you have the streets actually in your packet here, uh, and and I think you also have the demographic breakdown. There. That's about as close as we can get without doing some really strange things, uh, but it balances the schools pretty well. Uh, you're never going to get exact. Uh, in one school there's a higher special ed population, in another school there's a higher uh, non-white population. Uh, but you're, again, you're never going to be balanced totally. There's a difference of 10 students right now with our current student population projected forward. Uh, there's only a difference of 10 students between the two schools in total. I think uh, the process worked pretty well. Uh, and I think we're, we're ready, uh, I think, to move. If you approve that as your as the lines as as an as as an action at some point, I believe it will probably take an, an action of the school committee to establish those boundaries. Uh, then what we would do is send a letter to every parent, notifying them of their schools uh, their their child's school for next year. We would publish this on our website, uh, including the streets and street names uh, and and everything like that. The demographic breakdown, probably the entire memo, would go onto the website and uh, allow parents to start accessing that information as quickly as we can. As a follow-up to that, we have tentatively now then, from that, been able to establish the number of sections in each building at each grade level, and we've tentatively assigned staff based on their, uh, the survey that they filled out, uh, tentatively where they might be placed next year. We'll finalize that once we've got everything established and get the last couple of teachers to fill out the form. Uh, that we're waiting on. So I think that uh, we, we made good progress since our last meeting and our goal was to have this done by, by spring break. We've made that. I think by the end of spring break we would have to have everything hopefully settled and the teachers would know where they're going to be at what grade level and what building and the parents would start accessing that information very quickly as well. Mrs. Woodruff? Uh, thank you Mr. Chairman. To you Mr. Ely, I have a question um, on the grade one. Uh, does this these number of students include the transition grade one that we were speaking about at Eastford Road, or is that something totally separate that we're going to get information on later on? This includes all current all current kindergarten is going into first grade. It does not include the transition. The, all the there is no transition at this point. So all these kids would be in first grade in those two buildings. One of the issues we had is we don't have any teachers who are interested in teaching the transition first grade. Uh, so, so it's very possible we don't have a transitional first grade and we just have a pre-kindergarten, kindergarten, early childhood center and our, kin and our first graders are in the one through five buildings. Uh, and so uh, I, I'm, I'm not a big believer in forcing people to teach in an area that they're not comfortable with and our teachers are struggling to kind of pare that number of students down to a manageable number anyway. Uh, so, so right now we have all current kindergartners move forward into first grade at Charlton Street and West Street. Okay, great. Thank you. Mr. Ziggler? I, I have a question simply uh, uh, about really this geographics of if I'm on Worcester Street and I'm on a bus going to West Street, how long am I going to be on the bus? Well, our plan would be to run a bus just up, start start at one in a Charlton and move it, move our way toward the building. I don't think you're going to be on a bus more than 15, 20 minutes probably. I yep. mean, it depends on how many stops we put along the way. Uh, it's, a, it's a busy road, as you know. Uh, so we, we would, uh, would be very careful about the, you know, 
where we have kids picked up. Uh, so depending on the number of stops, I would anticipate, and I don't know the exact number of students that live on Worcester Street that would go to West Street, but I'm anticipating there'd be a, a full bus there. Uh, pretty close. Pretty close to say, a full bus. That, so that actually might be one of the shorter routes. Yeah, it's actually going to be zip up that road, pick kids up, and then head over to West Street. The, the, bus, will, the bus will fill up fairly quickly just on that one street. Okay, an, another question, just a follow-up follow -up question uh, would be, if I was on Worcester Street and I was living at 100 Worcester Street at the Charlton Street cutoff, would I be normally walking to school? It is possible that you would have been, yes. That, Do we, that's okay. Do we have any idea of the distance between that area to West Street versus that area to Charlton Street School? Um, not off the it's, top it's of It's about mind. halfway. Yeah, it's about <laughs> I, I think it may be a little closer to Charlton Street. Right. Uh, I think it's closer to Charlton Street. It's closer to Charlton Street. Street. The yeah. problem is really the demographic issue. The reason Worcester Street was selected was because by taking Worcester Street to West Street, you balance the demographics much, much better. I understand. What, I, what I'm getting at is if I'm a parent, I'm playing devil's advocate. Obviously. I understand. And if I'm a parent and my kid is uh, at 19 Worcester Street and we're busing him over to uh, West Street, whereas uh, he could have been walking over to Charlton Street, what I'm doing in my head is I'm thinking in terms of time. If I'm at 19 Worcester Street, it's going to take me 20 minutes to walk over to Charlton Street School. It's going to, if I'm on the bus for 15 minutes, it's a wash, is what I'm saying. Yes. On the other hand, if it takes me 15 minutes to walk over to Charlton Street from the start of Worcester Street, and I'm on the bus for 45 minutes to go to West Street, and I'm a parent, then I'm going to have an issue. Yeah, we but, won't have any 45-minute bus rides. No, I, I, I do not believe that that is even remotely possible, that there'll be that big of a discrepancy. I mean, we looked at various things with Worcester Street, including trying to take each side of Worcester Street, mm -hmm. doing the Charlton Street side, obviously, for Charlton Street, and the Worcester Street, I mean, the West Street side for West Street. And we just couldn't make the demographics work without taking the whole street and okay. putting it at West Street. I want to make it clear that I'm not in disagreement with this. What I'm simply doing is... Mm -hmm. Playing devil's uh, yeah, advocate. We, we've anticipated a lot of a lot of those devil's advocate kind of questions that come from a lot nicer, not not as nice sources as you probably. So we, we anticipate that we're going to have some questions, okay. uh, but yeah. the decisions were made with the best interest of the students in mind and the best interest of the district in terms of balancing enrollment in the two buildings and trying to balance not only the demographics of the buildings but also the special ed populations as well as the ELL populations <coughs> and keep everybody happy. Uh, I think it's an impossible task, but I, I, I think we, we've done about as good a job as we could do right now. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Mr. Lazar? Uh, not so much a question as much as a comment. We have kids right now that get bussed from Worcester Street to West Street. Right now we have fifth graders and fourth graders. The way we bus mm -hmm. things now, we bus everybody from Child Street area that's a fourth, fifth grader to West Street. So when you talk about the balancing, and you're talking about taking one bus in a straight line down Worcester Street and straight to West Street, that's going to cut the bus route down Quite quicker bit. than now. Uh, and I do agree with uh, Mr. DiGregorio, and I'm going to just say it this way. The, it's not perfect. There's nothing that's going to be perfect. But I've got to mm -hmm. say, once we get underway in the, spring, in the uh, fall of September this year, I think that uh, we're going to knock the tin out of it, so to speak. I mean, you're going to get the mm -hmm. usual complaints that we always get about this, that, and the other thing. And, but I, I really think that uh, going back through to the one through five concept uh, will make it all worth it once we get settled in. I agree. It's going to be a very busy year uh, in, the, uh, in the fall with the, both the high school, middle school, and the elementary schools. But I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I think uh, great job on the, on, the, uh, on the graph that we have here. Easy to understand. Thank you. Um, Terry, I see in your memo that you did have a recommendation, so I guess uh, it, what we'll do is take that up on the April 24th meeting, your recommendation to authorize the school administration we'll the to develop a school enrollment. And what I would ask is if perhaps during that time period we could keep this map out here in the, in the foyer cool. for uh, people to come up and look at and maybe with a list of the street addresses that are proposed. Uh, attached to that? What we, what we probably will do, if it's okay, is we'll publish the street names and school designations on our website, right. yeah. which will allow people to also access it that way, and we'll ask the newspaper to give us 
uh, an opportunity to at least you know share with them what we've tried to do, uh, and hopefully that'll get the word out. I, I don't really want to send a letter to somebody until we establish those zones, mm -hmm. uh, but but allowing people to, to access it here and, and allowing people to access it on our website is a, is a way to get some feedback if we have any feedback. Right. So we'll get that as soon as possible, and if we can get a snapshot of that map on the on the web too. Yeah, I think that's one of the other things we've we've talked about trying to do is either a snapshot of the map or uh, I may take a look and see whether or not I can create something out of Google Maps if that works better, you know, but one way or the other to get that visual out there. All right. And then have the motion on the next agenda. And, and at that meeting, too, uh, Mr. Ely, you should have uh, possibly the teacher assignments and everything? We should have them. Well, we should have them about done by then, if not done. Right now we're, we're working on close. classroom teachers, but we have not apportioned out the Title I, the okay. ESL, or special ed teachers. They're right now still in their own, in their buildings that they're, we've only really worked with uh, direct classroom teachers. Okay, very good. <clears throat> Item B, the ad hoc committee update on maintenance department. No report at this time. Thank you. Item C, the accelerated improvement plan, Ms. Dealey. The accelerated improvement plan is in, has been in uh, for a couple of weeks now. Uh, we have not heard a word. Uh, we had a visit, uh, a site visit here, I don't know, about a week and a half ago. Uh, and uh, we've, I think we sent the school committee a number of emails that had a, about a 200 pages of, <laughs> as Mr. DiGregorio told me, we didn't kill a bunch of trees, we sent it to you via email, and three emails because it was too big. That's all the evidence that we presented to the state. Uh, we'll just have to wait and see what the, the result of that is because that's the, that's the next QPR, the quarterly progress report that you'll get uh, in probably early May. Uh, and then uh, from that, we'll see where we go. Uh, so it'll be an assessment of what we've gone from, from February to now. We've gone a long way, as you can see from the evidence, and, and we have presented quite a bit of evidence to the state to go through. So, okay. Any questions on that? Superintendent's evaluation tool. Um, we met uh, last Tuesday um, to discuss the evaluation tool for the superintendent. Uh, we went, met with Mr. Ely and the school committee and came up with an instrument that's been attached to the, to the uh, uh, agenda for this evening. Uh, the items to evaluate will be under instructional leadership, organizational leadership, administration and management, community relations, and relationship with the school committee. Um, this will be the uh, first step, uh, as we discussed at the meeting on Tuesday, the state is putting uh, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education has formulated rules for all administrative evaluations going from the superintendent top down uh, that are being asked to be implemented. Um, this, we did uh, reach out to uh, the Mass Association of School Committees for guidance relative to that new instrument. Their suggestion was to wait to next year for the implementation on that as they develop and continue um, guidance on that and to meet with them to do that. So this was our step to at least get an evaluation done this year. So that I asked the superintendent to put in our packet. And uh, if I could, uh, uh, the plan was to get, uh, pass these out tonight, have them back for the 24th so they can be tabulated uh, and then presented probably the first week in May. But I would ask for an, uh, entertain a motion to suspend the rules and add an agenda item, um, 11 E or 11 D, subsection one, I guess. Uh, vote to approve the superintendent evaluation instrument um, as presented. Make sure. a motion to waive the rules to add the agenda item. Is there a second on that? Second. Any discussion on that? Seeing none, roll call. Mr. DiGregorio? Yes. Mr. Jovian? Yes. Mr. Lazo? Yes. Mrs. Principe? Yes. Mrs. Woodruff? Yes. Five yes. Is there any discussion on the uh, this topic at all? <coughs> all right. Seeing none, roll call to accept the superintendent's evaluation tool. Mr. Jovian? Yes. Mr. Lazo? Yes. Mrs. Principe? Yes. Mrs. Woodruff? Yes. Mr. DiGregorio? Yes. Five yes. Okay. 
it asks that those be returned uh, for the uh, April 24th meeting to be tabulated um, and then for presentation with the superintendent. Any other unfinished business? Seeing none, new business. Next regular school committee meeting will be held on April 24th, 2012 in council chambers. Mr. Lazar. Uh, on the new business, I'd like to uh, just, just bring up, a, a, it came to my attention uh, that we're going to be discontinuing our express line at the high school. Um, I kind of, I was, I was a little upset with it. Um, as I heard, someone said we were discriminating against the free lunch program by having the express line. And I thought we were discriminating against the people that use the express line. So I, as a school committee member, just want to show my discontents towards that move that I think it's incorrect. Not only for the kids and the quality of what we do up there, it's one of those things that we brought it up a step and we're dumbing it down again. I just got in a discussion over paying for the food service equipment. I can remember a few years back when I sat as chair of the school committee, the vans, the equipment, everything was bought by uh, food service. That's when they had a very powerful express line. Our express line on Friday will probably accumulate an income between four and five hundred dollars just on Friday. When you turn around and you say you don't have the money in the account to purchase the equipment for the food service equipment, so we'll use the school budget money, which I understand that's what has to happen, but at the same time you're cutting out a profitable express line that lacks common sense. Now, I'm sure that I'm going to hear that, well, if somebody else from out of town that's from the state said that we can't do this, we can do this. Uh, the, more, the less I see the state in our district, the happier I am. It seems like it runs smoother without the state, not with the state. So I don't know if it's a school committee decision or a food service decision uh, or where this, um, where this lands, but getting rid of the express line is just downright doesn't make sense. And I think that that's what we have to uh, work with, uh, again, to step backwards. And uh, I hope that our food service director at least has the, uh, the ability to, to maintain what we have going into our new school and doing what we do up there. So, you know, it's just, again, taking away from the ones that do pay because of the ones that don't pay. And it's awfully disheartening as a citizen of Southbridge. And then we ask ourselves, What's wrong with Southbridge? Thank you. Mrs. Woodruff? Um, I'm all set with the, if you're discussing what Scott wants to, I don't know if Mary uh, Ellen wants to stay yeah. on the same you're, subject. You're I have a different gonna, subject. Okay. Mrs. Mrs. Principal? I, I, Scott, I don't know what, I can't follow this. I don't know what's going on. Mr. Wiggins? I, and first off, I would have to say that I don't necessarily disagree with Mr. Lazo that sometimes it would be a lot easier without the state here. Um, personal opinion, not necessarily the opinion of the committee. Um, the, this is a federal regulation. Um, the concept is that it's not so much that we're trying to actually dumb down, it's really rather that we're trying to create a situation where when any child goes through the food service lines, uh, that first off, you don't know whether that child is free, reduced, full pay, whatever the situation is. With the a la carte, the concept was, and I was present for the report from the state, this is a regular audit that state does with all kinds of food service programs, um, and I was very concerned about it as well. The idea is not to necessarily dumb down our a la carte, but rather to create a situation where all the students can go through and if a student goes through the a la carte, that they can choose enough a la carte to create a reimbursable meal. And so the meal is still reimbursable. They're just getting, instead of the standard service, if you will, they're able to get the same reimbursable meal, but now in an a la carte fashion uh, by putting together the necessary elements. The way the new high school, the new middle high school is designed, this is exactly how the line would work. And frankly, we asked to delay this until we got up to the new middle high school the state indicated to us that we could not do that, okay? And again, it is in part a state regulation, but it's really more federal guidelines. Mr. Terry, 
am I correct in assuming that the, what's available in the a la carte line that we're eliminating is now going to be available in the regular line? Well, actually, I think, again, uh, we have an excellent, excellent um, kitchen manager. I, I would rather call him a chef, okay, at the high school. I think everybody knows. And I, he and Sue Pinkham, our food service director, have been working very hard to develop, you know, new a la carte items that can try and both maintain that quality, but also, you know, fit the needs of being able to offer the different components. Um, so I would say, will there be some changes in the a la carte in the short term um, because of the limitations of how our current kitchen works, that is possible. In the long term, I actually, and again, the way the new kitchen is designed, the way the new cafeteria is designed, I actually really see the a la carte expanding and not, and not being declined. Did you have a question on food service? Is it yeah, along the so same Ms. discussion? Do you mind, Mrs. No, Woodrow? go right ahead, go ahead. Mr. I just, I just want to say this, and, and let's, let's pretend I'm at home, I don't have any kids in the school system, and we just pushed out a la carte, <laughs> express lines, free lunch, and a reimbursable meal. Does this committee really believe anybody understands what we're talking about? Excellent point. Because I really tend to doubt that they do. Uh, I, you know, when Mr. Lazo was discussing uh, his discontent, he was talking about an express lineup. And then we went from that to an a la carte line. I, I would assume the express line is the a la carte line. However, is the free lunch also the a la carte? And if it isn't the a la carte, what makes a reimbursable meal reimbursable if you have free lunch? Exactly. Okay, right. so. That's what I was trying to okay, let, let me try to sort it out. Um, there are five components to a reimbursable meal. You have to have at least three components. Okay, to make it a reimbursable meal. The current, and, and again, I would, I would yield to, to Mr. Lazo, who's probably seen it far more than I have, frankly, as far as how it works, but the express line, uh, I guess in a sense you could call it the a la carte line, but the a la carte items are items that are not, that are created um, independently of what the regular menu lunch is. They are designed so that they can be purchased as individual or a la carte items. They could be purchased in addition to the standard reimbursable lunch. They, are, they could be purchased in place of the reimbursable lunch. The issue with the federal guidelines is that what they now require, and they have changed dramatically in the last two years, what they require is that if you offer a la carte, that you have to offer a la carte items and you have to have your students be passing through that a la carte so that they have the opportunity to choose at least three items that will put together the components of a reimbursable meal. That can be, and again in the short term because of our limitations, may be interpreted as, as downgrading our a la carte. Again, I know Mr. Billis, who's the, the, I want to call him the chef manager up there, is working very, very hard with Sue Pinkham to develop some new a la carte items that will maintain the quality but also be able to put together that reimbursable meal. But a la carte really is, is describing an item, an individual item, that can be purchased independently and separately. Um, reimbursable meal is typically what you will see on the school menus that go out and are posted, okay? Um, and those are basically produced and put together, generally speaking, with all five components. Um, but it is an offer versus serve. So as long as you have three components on a plate, again, it's a reimbursable. Mrs. Gregor, you had a follow-up question, yeah. I believe. Well, <laughs> and, 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 and that was as clear as mud, I know. Yeah, that was great. Uh, components taste good. They do. Uh, <laughs> I would assume that by components we're talking about food groups. And for it to be a reimbursable meal, you have to have five food groups, be it grain. There's, there's milk, basically grain, yeah. protein, I, let me see if I can remember it. Dairy. Dairy, okay. grain, protein, dairy. <laughs> vegetable. Fruit, vegetable. I think those are the five. Awesome. 
Now, beyond that, you said that, or I, from what I understood, a reimbursable meal can also be an a la carte. To be a la carte, does that mean I need to get five different a la cartes to you would, make it reimbursable? You would have to have three a la carte items that would represent three of those five components. So, for example, if on a la carte you were able to get a milk, a fruit, uh, and a grain, that would be a reimbursable meal. And kids actually understand this stuff. Well, that's part of what we're going to have to go through and educate. Them. And the state wants, the last, my very last point is the state wants everybody to have the opportunity to go through the a la carte line, even if you want a, just a regular meal. If I go in there and I say, hey, you know what, I want a cheeseburger, the fries, the ketchup will be the vegetable, or whatever, <laughs> the whole nine yards, I still have to go through the a la carte line to get to my reimbursable, regular, state-of-the-art burger? <laughs> that, that is essentially true. I guess, I, again, in fairness to the state, this is actually a federal regulation. So yes, the state is enforcing it. It is actually a federal regulation. Okay. That's okay. I, I'm, I'm, thank you. I'm, I'm clear on this now. I, I'm not sure I am yet either, but I understand. Okay, thank I you. Explain it. I think maybe Ms. Benoit, being uh, a student, I might be able to do this. Um, every day at lunch, there's two separate lines in the cafeteria. One side, you walk in, it's mandatory that you take a milk, either salad or an apple, as your fruit and vegetable, and what they offer, that can be the little hamburgers in the bags, or the six inch round pizza, or the veggie lo mein, whatever it is. It's mandatory that you take that. If you don't eat it, that doesn't matter. But you have to have that on your tray. And then you get, that's when you enter your pin. And the express line, or a la carte line, is they offer chicken, um, soup, salad, sometimes shepherd's pie. Mr. Billis makes these every morning. And on that side, you get that. You don't have to take anything else from that. All you have to do is take that, and you can go. You can get a milk on that side. You can get, they offer salad. They also offer, at the end, you can get water, fruit juices, all of that outside of the line. It's a separate thing that you have to pay for. So it's two separate lines. Yes, you pay the a la carte line it's usually like a dollar twenty-five, two dollars for each item, and then the regular line. I think the normal lunch is a dollar seventy-five, two dollars for right. all three parts. Okay, she made it make sense. That's what I was. Mr. Lazo, uh, I, I, I noticed you mentioned the chef's name. That's not where I heard this from. My daughter came home and was discussing it. Like all the students go home and tell their parents that we are now gonna start bringing our lunches instead of buy from the school. That's what you're gonna create. And the reason why I'm saying this is, we already lived this disaster once before. You're gonna have a decline in purchases, your, your lunch profits are gone, and as usual, the state and federal government really don't care because there's minimum accountability at that level as far as profit and loss. It's always about the 70% free lunch. It's not about the 30%. It's about the 70%. Now, we can dress it up any way we want to dress it up. I'm sad that the food service director or the state person or the federal person or whoever came in to change this didn't come in front of the school committee or the board that supposedly is in charge of the school system um, to actually air this out before putting anything forward. And I, I think that what you're going to end up happening, and what's going to end up happening, and you're going to see, is that certain kids are going to bring their lunches in a bag and a thermos and all that stuff there. I mean, if you can postpone it till we get into the new building, I think that would be a fantastic um, idea. But I really think that uh, this isn't our first time around the block. We've seen this system go down through the floor once before. It's food service, it's AP courses, the deficit we dealt with, the cuts on teachers. You know, history is a teacher. And I've been here along with a lot of other people up here that I just don't want to see us go on the slippery slope again, only to say, oops, how many times do you want to go backwards before we get it right and stay up top? And that's the problem with what I see happening with this, this deal here. I think they're, uh, you know, we'll deal with it when the time comes. The parents will let us know, I'm sure. Thank you. Mr. Gregory, did you have one more follow-up to yeah. that? Last one. Maybe. Paulina, did you say 
I, I just, I, maybe, I, maybe I misunderstood. Did you say that there was a point when you're in line that there is food that you have to, you have to take? Yes, on the normal lunch line, which is the, like, the same lunch that every school gets, the one that gets sent High out, day. it's you have to take the milk, you have to take the salad or the fruit that they're offering, and okay, you have so to take it. I'm, I'm Joey Freshman, and I come in, and there's an apple, and there's milk, and there's a salad, and then there's the stuff I want, the pizza and the other mm -hmm. thing. To get to the pizza, you have to take have the milk to take the other and stuff the salad, too. yes. Even if I tell the person behind the counter, I'm not eating that. Correct. And what happens to that apple and that milk? Um, the milks usually get traded, and the apples usually end up being thrown out or okay, so let me, bowled right. down the hallway. So when you're, uh, when you're going through, because we used we went through line, and you got to that little, like, bowl, you know, that thing that looks like a big, giant garbage disposal thing. Mm -hmm. When you when you get there, you see a lot of apples. Yeah. And stuff and fruit. And yeah, in the trash you see it all, or like the other kids will take it from you and stuff. So but they tell you you have to take it in order. You'll still get charged with it if you don't take it. All right. So if I don't want, and I just say I can, just can I leave it? Can I leave it, it if I want? Even, if, I, even if they're gonna charge me? No. Nope, they still I make you take it. Take it. Yes. And I have to back up Mr. Lazo. A lot of the kids are telling, already saying they've already started bringing their lunches because they don't like that. And the free reduced lunch kids still buy the other side. I stand 100% by what I, what I said the other day about how I feel about the state. Uh, and the federal government's very close behind that. But thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Mrs. Woodruff? Um, yeah, just to put a little input on this. Um, the problem is, is it's a state requirement for the children, a federal requirement, and we are not supposed to discriminate from those children who cannot afford it, nor are we supposed to even know what children who cannot afford it. The free and reduced, the reduced is a lower cost. They all fill out the paperwork. In order for us, I believe, to get reimbursed, we have to do it this way and we cannot be discriminated, and the children cannot feel differently because they cannot afford what other children can pay. And I think the problem is, is when you have two lines like that, it somewhat discriminates. I'm not saying that's what the government said when they came in, but I know for a fact that's why they have to take those three items and then we get reimbursed. And if they don't take those items, whether they trade it in or they give the milk back and some child who wants a second milk can have it because it's already paid for, that's how they work it. And I think that's the understanding that they don't want other people to know that there are children out there who cannot afford something that someone else can afford. Ms. Daly? Uh, and I understand all of that. Ironically, I don't think the kids care. That's I think this is an idea. adult issue. Yeah. That, that the federal government has somebody there has bureaucratically decided that this is what you have to do to get your reimbursement. The state has to tell us that if you don't do this, you don't get your federal reimbursement, therefore we have to do it. it it's not anything we want to do, and I think that, that I think every, we have to do it. Now, I, I still think there's a possibility for, to save this situation, only because I know, I know how hard that the, the people that are involved here are working to keep the quality up. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I wish we could postpone it. We tried to postpone it till next year. We just aren't allowed to. But I think there's a pretty good plan in place to make sure that the, te the students have the options. And it does seem like now every student will have a wide variety of options. And hopefully they'll take good, good, good uh, uh, I guess, good, uh, a good chance to get that, I'm, I guess. I'm happy to make a formal request in writing I'd like I, for you to do that. I'm happy to do that. I, I do not anticipate the response I would like to get, but I'm happy to make that. It'll come around in October. Mm. So, okay. Mr. Lazo? Can we have a school committee vote to go behind that uh, recommendation at the next meeting? You know, I think, I think uh, committee member Woodruff said it exactly the way it was said by the person from the federal or state government. It's unbelievable how discrimination only runs one way. That's probably the part that bothers me the most. 
When they leave school and they only can afford to buy a $10 pair of jeans and not a $40 pair of jeans, is the state going to step up and buy that too? That's the problem with society. We always cater to the bottom end and forget about the people in the middle because the high end's doing well. You don't have to worry about them. And again, that's the thing you always talk about, the middle class. It left Southbridge, they said. I don't believe it. There's still middle class here. And I think that they are entitled um, as far as an option. You cut the option out. That's what bothers me. It's not that you're discriminating against the free lunch program. It's an option you're offering to every kid and every family in the town of Southbridge. Why can't we look at it as quality? We stepped up the quality in this line to have that option. It makes money every week for the food service. But we'll put a free feeding program in the summertime that loses money every single year. And then we're going to sit here and tell you, I can't believe that we don't have enough money to buy a brand new refrigerator van to cart our food around. And you wonder why the taxpayers of this community are upset at the government? Look at the way the government operates. You couldn't operate this way in the private sector. You'd be out of business. And I'm a Democrat. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lund. Mrs. Woodruff, did you have another item? You I did to have another new business item. Thank you. Um, it doesn't have anything to do with food. Um, I didn't bring this item up earlier. I was waiting to see if it was going to come up, and it hasn't yet. With the new reconfiguration and the new buildings, um, my concern and perhaps some concerns of parents out there is what is going to happen, or perhaps we can get an update as to what is going to be happening with the summer program that we offer um, the SPED children and the children that we usually have a five-week, six-week summer program in the buildings. And with all the rearranging of buildings and moving things and, and this and that, I think um, it would um, be nice to have an update on that program. Okay. Um, and so that the parents that are involved in that program know where their children might be, how it's going to run, and, and that kind of thing. Yeah, I can tell you right now, if, if and when, we are, we are going to run summer programs. We will run them at the old high school, Cole Avenue. Okay. We will not be running any programs at Charlton Street or West Street because of the moves that we have to make furniture-wise within those buildings. And I just think Eastford Road won't have appropriate furniture for, for the old age of kids we have to have in that building. So we would have it at the, at the, uh, the current high school. Okay, so if we could just, um, this will be the first time the parents heard of it. Yeah, so if we, we could we just can, send something out, we will. obviously, and yeah. um, so that they have the heads up on that. Cause and I'm, I've been kind of holding off because we have a grant out there that, that uh, proves that, that, that if we receive the grant, we're in, in partnership with a, a, a a nonprofit foundation that will create a summer and after school program oh, for nothing for us. I just haven't heard about the grant. If we do that, we'll be able to service a lot more kids in the summer and it'll all be housed at the old high school for the first year. Great, thank you. Thank you. Any other new business? Seeing none, school committee reports, curriculum, Mr. Uh, Digger Gordon. Nothing to report, nothing scheduled. Policy, Mrs. Woodruff. Um, yes, we had two meetings. We had a meeting last week at 6 o'clock, and we had a meeting this week at 6 o'clock. The agenda of our meetings, basically, um, it was brought to our attention to possibly change our policy on the age of kindergarten entrance. Um, we have decided that we are going to keep the entrance of five years by August 31st or before the same age. But we are going to meet again and come up with a policy for perhaps a... Um, uh, not a, well, a skip, but to, to be able to advance a grade one time within your elementary ages. So for children who may be above average, well above average, you'd have to go through assessments and things like that. But we're going to come up with a new policy um, for that um, and keep the entrance age the same. Um, we also discussed our code of conduct um, for the high school, middle high school. Um, we have decided to put that on hold until the new school year starts because it was going to be a big project to do. We want to um, be able to have principals, teachers, parents um, join and form a committee to come up with a better um, code of conduct um, for the building. So for now, we're going to try and hold off on that. We do have um, code of conducts and um, behaviors and all that in the handbooks right now, 
um, but it just does not, we don't have enough time to, to try and put something into effect before the new school year starts. Um, and that basically was it. I'll have minutes to the meeting available. We'll put them on the website if anyone has any questions or anything. Um, you can give the superintendent a call or myself, but we'll get those minutes of the meeting up there so everybody can see that. And that's it. Budget facilities and transportation, Dr. Domenko's not here, but I do not believe she has any meeting scheduled at this time. We are meeting with the town council yes, on Thursday evening for uh, budget uh, for the upcoming year with the uh, edu uh, sure. Education and Human Services uh, Subcommittee. Uh, collective bargaining, Mr. Lazo. Mr. Chairman, is that meeting with the EHNS uh, on Thursday, is that at 7 o'clock? I believe it's 6.30. Is it 6.30, Terry? Uh, 6.30, I think it's at 6.30. I believe it was at 6.30. 6.30 on, on the 15th, is that? No, the 12th. 12. I'm sorry, the 12th. This Thursday, this Thursday at the 12th. I will double check that time and, and get it out to the committee. Okay. I believe it is 6.30 from the email that I got. Thank you, Max. Let me just check my Thank calendar. Thank you. Uh, report on the, let's see. I have no report at this time for collective bargaining, the subcommittee, but as the chairman of the uh, building committee, I would just like to update that we do have tours going on. Uh, you don't have to come to the front office and pick up the sign-in sheets. We have them on site. Uh, the monthly meetings will be taking, uh, taking place Saturday on the 21st at 9 o'clock. Uh, just for information, uh, Sandy Ackley and myself teamed up uh, for a tour with all the realtors in the area. Um, it's very important that the realtors know that the new middle high school is uh, coming online and uh, it's a big impact on realtors on when they're selling homes. So the first question uh, to the realtor is, how are the schools? And I think that uh, showing the realtors uh, what we're doing and keeping them informed can further um, educate the realtors as far as what Southbridge is and who we are and what we're doing and where we are and where we're going. So I think all those questions can be answered as we do this on the uh, April 26th on a Thursday at 3.30. We also have an upward bound program that uh, wants to tour approximately 15 people on Saturday, April 28th at 9 o'clock. Um, our building committee meeting is on April 18th at 5 o'clock in the Hyman Room, if anybody would like to attend. Um, and again, uh, if anybody would like to tour the high school, please give me a call uh, or contact the superintendent and we can set it up for a different date. I know if Spiro wanted a date, they didn't get back to me, but uh, we're trying to keep one open for them. Thank you. Thank you. There is no executive session this evening. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? And I'm all present. Thank you and have a good weekend.